And I would like to introduce John Feenstra, who will introduce our speaker for tonight. John? All right. Well, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Justin Stahl. Uh, Justin is the project manager for the Institute for Wildlife Studies San Clemente Loggerhead Shrike Monitoring and Release Project on San Clemente Island, uh, where he has worked since 2008. Uh, Justin's been an eBird reviewer since 2012 uh, here in LA and in San Diego County, and an active user since uh, 2010. Uh, he's the current chair of the California Bird Records Committee uh, and compiles the uh, San Diego Christmas bird count um, when he's not on San Clemente Island. Uh, Justin enjoys exploring his <clears throat> five mile radius in San Diego and spending as much time as he can in the tropics with his wife, Nicole. Uh, so uh, yeah, again, it is my pleasure to introduce Justin. Thanks, John and everybody. Uh, get this fired up here. I think I got all the kinks out earlier. Oops. Back to the beginning and full screen. Okay, that's hopefully showing up for everybody as it looks great, Justin. Thank as you. As it did when tested. Okay, I'm gonna just hide this screen so I can see my slides. Okay, um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, this talk is uh, the culmination of you know hundreds of emails with eBird users. Um, conversations with, uh, you know, eBird users, lots of emails back and forth with reviewers, especially um, people I work closely with on the LA review team, like Kimball Garrett, Christine, John Garrett. Um, and my hope is to uh, dispel a few myths, maybe, that uh, may persist about eBird and also um, uh, you know, get people on the right track if they aren't already with uh, some of the best practices you can be doing to just increase the overall eBird data set. Because a, a theme that will come up hopefully a couple of times is, um, you know, it's a positive feedback loop. It's a sort of a give and take situation with eBird. And, and hopefully by um, eliciting better behavior, um, others will follow suit. Um, LA is sort of a prime area for birding. And uh, the more people that use, um, you know, the input uh, in a, the most correct way, the output is kind of better for everybody in a global sense. I mean, people coming to LA, but also hopefully this behavior runs downhill into other areas. And so that when you're in, I don't know, North Dakota, people are using best practices as well. And so the data that you use to plan your trip or, you know, track down a, a rarity um, is in the best shape it can be. So, uh, let's see. So, where is LA in terms of like the global eBird picture? Um, as John Garrett, I think mentioned uh, at the last um, LA Birders seminar about the discussed eBird, um, he may have mentioned that LA um, from a county level um, scale, um, it's like the most active, you know, generates the highest number of checklists um, in the world uh, for that, um, you know, political entity size. And if you think about California, um, they, California eBirders have generated 4.2 million checklists. Over 10% of those have come from LA. And LA uh, benefits from having this complex topography with mountains and coast and ocean and offshore islands. Um, and all of this leads to, you know, a high diversity of, of local um, migratory and, you know, vagrant avifauna. Uh, which then leads to, you know, a higher number of rarities probably than, you know, most areas. And um, not only resident birders, but out-of-town birders coming to chase rarities or just, you know, road tripping around California, but business executives spending the weekend in, in Santa Monica and then, and then getting out and going birding. And so all of this leads to, um, you know, this really rich data set and sort of a spotlight being on Los Angeles. And we're very busy as eBird reviewers. And my hope is that by, um, as I said in the beginning, um, best practices, by employing best practices, you generate a lot of data. So hopefully these, you know, 434,000 checklists aren't, you know, all incorrectly entered and, and uh, you can raise the bar, uh, so to speak. 
So the overview of tonight's talk, I'm briefly, I'm briefly going to discuss, you know, the, the basic differences between the eBird app that you have on your phone and then the website itself, eBird.org. Um, I'm going to go through five sort of main problems uh, we encounter as reviewers uh, and the best ways for users to sort of avoid um, getting those emails. You might get, you know, a question about your whatever uh, bird location, et cetera. And those, those being, you know, the location, uh, you know, documenting, documenting birds, making sure your distance and effort and everything is correct, that that checklist is complete or not. It's, it's fine if it's not, but understanding what complete means. And then sort of the, the, the best way to share checklists and why sharing and, and receiving shared checklists is, is important. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about managing media um, and sort of the ways that you can, uh, increase the value of your photos or audio or video um, with tags and, and using those rated those star ratings. Um, briefly going to talk about just what the review process is and kind of what it looks like from our end. And you know when you hear people talk about the filters, what that means and and why things may be rare or uh, you know you get the little exclamation point for a, a high a high count. And then you know, bring it all home with, well, you know, we've, we've done such a good job creating this rich data, like how can we use it um, to not only find birds or plan trips, but um, to fill in gaps, you know, there's, it's, a, it's a, a very popular area for birding, but, you know, birders often tend to just go to the same kind of spots over and over again, or they may go chase that rarity or that year bird or life bird, and then go straight home and not, you know, give back by stopping somewhere else along the way, perhaps. So time and time again, I, I run into people uh, through email and mostly that, you know, oh, there's no way to upload this photo or, oh, I, I, I had to update the app and I lost my life list. And, and there's this, there seems to be a disconnect among a certain percentage of people that, that they don't realize that, that eBird is, you know, a website and a database, and that the app itself is really just a portal into that. And for a long time, that portal was it was one way. Now it's grown by leaps and bounds to where you can do almost everything through the app. Um, and I'm, I'm mainly going to talk about the app itself, um, but most of these um, philosophies we'll discuss are the same. Whether you're you're a pen and paper uh, entering it uh, on your computer at home, or you're you're doing it all. Uh, from the app, but you know, media cannot be uploaded via the app. It has to be done via the web, either the browser on your phone or you know from your from your computer at home. But um, you know, I think the majority of people these days are entering. Pardon me if this if you can hear this plane flying over right now, but uh, the majority of people I believe are entering data primarily uh, from their phone, and then hopefully are modifying those checklists when they get home and and using a computer. So you know this. Checklist on the right is a, a checklist I kept on my phone with maybe some shorthand notes, but obviously I, I'm not going to type out all of this stuff in bulleted format about the snowy plover bands I saw on, on my phone. That was that was something I I uh, translated from from notes into you know something readable by by other people from from a laptop on the browser. So um, the five things I really want to talk about tonight are the best ways to make sure that the checklist you're submitting is the best it can be. And these five themes are going to be, one, is the location accurate? Two, um, are the counts accurate? And uh, are any rare birds you may have encountered, are those documented or, or high counts? You know, um, Is your effort, does, does the effort you expended reported, uh, hours, miles, kilometers, whatever, um, is that, an accurate representation of what you did, and with an emphasis on, you know, keeping shorter duration, short distance list. You know, you don't want to do an eight-hour, you know, twenty-mile uh, road trip. You know, crossing multiple habitat types. That's that's not the best approach. Um, the fourth thing is, you know, I'm going to define what a complete checklist entails and uh, why it's okay to report incomplete lists, but making sure that if they are incomplete, that they're labeled as such. And finally, I want to talk about a bit about uh, group birding, uh, pelagic trips, field trips, things like that. If everybody agrees to go, you know, meet up at the, the stakeout in the morning, why sharing checklists helps um, 
uh, with bar charts and, and targets and, and just sort of the, the data output downstream. So I think the most, one of the most common pitfalls I find related to locations is, and this has been fixed in a major way, but it's still, it's still a problem, is that people create a new location, some people, uh, will create a, a new personal location every time they use eBird, whether it's in their yard and they have 75 personal locations that all represent their yard, or they get to a hotspot and create a new personal location, um, whether on purpose or, or by accident. Um, sometimes it's, it's not clear, we'll get into that. Um, but the app was updated uh, I don't know, sometime in the last year, and it, it now it sort of nudges you in the direction of, of the right location, whether that be your personal yard or you know, the hotspot that you're parked in the parking lot of. And so what are, what are hotspots? I mean, a hotspot, it, it's a bit of a misnomer. It does not have to be like a place with high diversity and a, and a lot of, of birds. And uh, it doesn't, despite my saying frequently visited, it doesn't have to be frequently visited. It, it basically just has to be a location that more than one person birds. And so if it's a public park or a private you know, reserve, you know, something like Paiute Ponds, where you, you, it's not technically open to the public, you do have to get a, a badge to go in. But those are hot spots that um, you know, by people putting their data into those hot spots, it, it allows a number of uh, tools to be used that I'll, I'll go into briefly. The alternative is, is these personal locations. Um, they're basically just a unique location that only you use. Uh, it may be temporary. It may be, you know, a bird you saw, you know, from the side of the highway. It may be your yard that you use, you know, 20 times a day to do five minute stationary counts. But these are personal locations. Um, you know, the general public isn't going to be using them. And, uh, you know, those don't come with illustrated checklists and bar charts and, and things like that. And then there are these things that we call stakeouts, which it's basically a, a hotspot created specifically for a single, often single, uh, rarity. And the hope is that by everybody using that single location for sort of a temporary uh, rarity, you know, like a office park or, you know, um, you know, just the pull out on the side of the road somewhere. The hope is that by kind of getting all the data into that one location, you get this sort of like, you know, pull down menu of, of all of the data that's in there, as opposed to this sort of shotgun blast or like, you know, you've thrown a hundred darts at a dartboard and some of them are where the bird was, some of them are you know, where you parked and it just becomes this messy thing. And so we, we try to get ahead of the game and create these stakeouts when, when things pop up, um, when they're not at hotspots. Oftentimes, you know, these become, well, these are these tipu trees or this, this marsh that nobody had ever been to before. And it just becomes a, a hotspot in itself to be used later. But anyway, um, I condensed about, 10 slides into this one. Uh, so if I was rambling, I was, I was just sort of, uh, you know, uh, making my case for, for hotspots, which I'll, I'll come back to briefly. But right now, when you, when you fire up uh, your checklist, you're going to get this little uh, blurb at the top, auto-selected, and then some coordinates. You may get a street address. Um, and, but there, you, the common thing is you get these, this lat long at the end. And um, you can do this at the end. But ideally, I mean, I think most people do is the very first thing you do is then you click that and it brings up um, uh, one, of, one of two tabs. I think this map, the map pops up first. And if you're near a hotspot, this uh, was, uh, I started my phone in the parking lot out on San Clemente Island outside my office. And the, it, the recommended hotspot is Wilson Cove Town, which is absolutely a representation of where I was. And so I would click that. Now, the thing to be aware of is it's, picking up the closest hotspot typically or personal location. And there's a chance that, you know, just because you're on say the north side of the road, it is going to recommend the closest hotspot on the north side, but you may be crossing to go into the, to the south side. So if you just kind of pull up this little, you know, zipper at the bottom, you can see all the nearby hotspots out, you know, in, in descending or it, uh, increasing order of distance. And so if I had actually been sea watching, for example, then I, you know, I would click the one that best represents where I'm at. Now you do have the option to create this new location, which there are times that's appropriate. For instance, if you're starting up a new yard list or you're actually not at the park that you're closest to, but there's a small pocket park across the street and you wanna differentiate that. So you can do that. Um, 
But I don't know. Most times you're probably going to a hot spot, whether you're going to you know a, a well-trodden path like Paiute Ponds or Malibu Lagoon, or um, you know you're going to where the rare bird was reported, and chances are it was reported from a hot spot. So it makes sense just to use that. So if you wanted to create a new location, though, um, you can. And when we see these new locations pop up uh, in in eBird, like in the you know review queue or just in recent locations. It's often just the, the boilerplate um, location name. And what I think people don't realize is that these are editable. So if you want to create your new location, you, you click create location, and then you just click in the text box and the keyboard pops up and you, know, you can type in and call it whatever you want. Usually something descriptive is better rather than you know, 229 to 231 West you know, Alameda Boulevard with this you know, gobbledygook um, lat long thing. It just, I don't know, makes, it just makes for a neater presentation when you say, you know, the corner of this and that or, um, or whatever, but, uh, it often helps in, in the review queue when you, um, see things labeled correctly, that you know where this bird was like, oh, this is the black and white warbler at Madrona Marsh. But when they said, you know, whatever the cross street is there with the lat long, I don't have that memorized and just requires more time. So then you, you select your hotspot and it pops up. And then oftentimes you may get a checklist that then snaps to that local location or that local uh, quadrant that you're in. Um, and so, you know, I've talked a lot about hotspots. Well, what, what is the advantage of using hotspots? And I will try to make that case for you now and also just show you this hotspot tool that I don't know, maybe some people don't use. So when you're on eBird.org, you click explore and it should bring up you know, this option to explore hotspots and um, you type in the hotspot you may be thinking about visiting. And for example, you know, you'd search Paiute Ponds and it brings up this map and you can see other hotspots in the area. Uh, and then you would click on view details. Now I'm gonna go into a live mode real quick and show you uh, my browser. I can do this safely. Um, Let's see. So yeah, Paiute Ponds. And view details. Hopefully. And so what we can see in hotspots is a number of things. The most interesting thing is to me is the illustrated checklist which is available here in the left. And so the, the, the point I wanna make here is by, by submitting data to the hotspot, you're, you're fueling these sort of things. I don't know if there's, there we go. It's a lag on my end or the server, but you get these really cool illustrated checklists and these are available for hotspots. They're available for states and counties and countries and everything else, but you've got your bar chart. So you can see, you know, snow goose is sort of an expected thing maybe to see out at Paiute Ponds. And in theory, they should all leave and not be out there in the middle of the summer. And there's a representative photo and maybe representative audio. And, um, you know, cinnamon teal are out there all the time. Um, Eurasian widgeon has only been out there a few times. You know, so these illustrated checklists are really neat. And I've found that they make good study aids if you're traveling. Like I just went to Costa Rica and I would just go to the hotspot for, you know, Rancho Naturalista and just scroll through and see, okay, well, you know, uh, Emerald tanager is is there every day, so I should definitely you know know what that bird looks like by by interacting with the bar chart and then and the image. Um, another thing that uh, hotspots allow you to do is, oops, you can explore. Um, let me go back one. Uh, recent checklists. So, you know, what is a, what's a typical visit to Paiute Ponds this time of year? Well, uh, we can see the most, whoops, that's the profile for Nikki. Um, let's look at the actual checklist by clicking on the date. And, you know, it's just a quick way to see checklist. So you can go through and, and see what was seen. Um, Hotspots also allow you um, you know, a little competitive gaming of, uh, you know, who's, who's the number one birder at Paiute. You know, you, I'm, you know, 
a lost cause there, only having been there a handful of times. Um, uh, top media is really cool. Um, you can look and see uh, at last scene and first scene. So first scene allows you to look at new records. So this is always exciting. So um, at least in eBird, uh, back in November, um, this Harris's Sparrow was, was a first for Paiute Ponds. Um, you know, and then in October, that was the first red-breasted sapsucker. So that, that, that stuff is fun. And um, these are things that you miss out on uh, when things go in as, as personal locations. So that's my case for, for hotspots. So let me go back to this. Go back to full screen, hopefully. Okay, so that was you know making sure the location is accurate. That's that's uh, that's the important thing. Uh, you should be using a hotspot if you're near it. Um, you should make sure you're not plotting it in your yard if you're entering a checklist from the morning when you were at Malibu Lagoon, unless your yard is overlooking Malibu Lagoon. The next thing, and this is probably the most important part, uh, is talking about rarity documentation. So if you get um, an alert on your app that that bird is either rare or it's a high count, um, you really should provide some sort of uh, documentation to back up that claim. Um, it might not actually be rare, it may be a difficult ID. You know, some areas may flag all of the impid max just to make sure people aren't you know, defaulting to, to Pacific Slope or defaulting to Hammonds in the spring when, when other birds are possible. Um, but this box is, it can be used for, you know, cute self, uh, you know, historic comments and definitely it can be a part of that. But if it's a rare bird, uh, in my opinion, the, the primary objective of that like little pop-up is for you to communicate to a reviewer and to the public um, what you saw uh, and, and why you think that rare bird is, is what it is. Because if, if this is going out on a rare bird alert, hundreds, thousands of people, you know, may be seeing this and they need to be able to make an objective decision about like, you know, is that gray cat bird uh, well-documented enough for me to, you know, jump on the boat and go out to Catalina Island to see it? Or, you know, just in terms of the long-term database, can somebody come back five years from now and say, you know, was this last, the last date of this, um, you know, groove build Ani, um, it was this really the last date? All it says is continuing or well seen, you know? And so things that aren't documentation are in a tree, seen well, ID by leader, you know, exactly like page 67. Um, the way I try to spin it back to users is given this statement, can you tell me what bird is being described? And of course they can't because nothing about this says anything. I mean, it, squirrels, you know, kids can climb trees, you know, so just the fact that it was in a tree, you know, John, um, Mark was singing a song earlier about a black turnstone in the tree. Um, so what we're looking for is um, photos are great. Um, there's a, you know, a, 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 a misconception that in these days you need to have a photo or, or you won't be believed. And that's, that's absolutely not true. I mean, if it's, you know, a first state record or first continental record, obviously you would you'd want photos or a second observer, but most often you're encountering things that written documentation is, is fine. If you're on a smartphone, you have a voice recorder, it's, it should be fairly easy to get uh, calls or a song if it's singing. And the important thing is if you're, if you're taking notes that it's at the time of the sighting. So as soon as your observation of that bird ends, you can just open your voice recorder and say, you know, here's, a, here's like the bulleted list of, of the field marks I saw. Um, or you know, jot things down, just bullet points in in the app, in in your in in the checklist itself. I mean, you're not expected to write, you know, a, a five paragraph essay on your phone. But what you don't want to do is see the bird, then drive home, and then maybe have dinner, and then watch a movie, and then look at your field guide, and then oh yeah, that's the bird I saw. Because at this point, your memory has been completely influenced and just altered. Uh, uncontrollably, but also especially influenced by once you start looking at photos and, you know, oh yeah, that I got home and that is, that is definitely the bird I saw um, that I'd never heard of until now. So it's important just to keep even rudimentary notes um, 
while you're in the field. And it should be what the bird looked like, not what the bird should look like or what that species looks like. So if you, if you encountered this black burning warbler and you didn't see these pale braces on the back, which are really helpful for confirming you know, that that is a, a black burning warbler, if you didn't see it, that's fine. Um, don't just you know, list off all the description, uh, description points from, from your Sibley or Nat Geo or whatever. Um, just you know, if you didn't see it and you only saw the sort of peachy orange thing and a triangular black face and some streaks and white wing bars, you know, it's, that's, you know uh, that's more than I think what a lot of people are writing. Um, and the rule of thumb is you, know, you, you want three at least three sort of field marks that you picked up on besides wings and, and beak and, and tail. <laughs> and it's helpful to eliminate similar species. So a yellow-throated warbler, for example, um, yellow rump warblers have yellow throats, hermit warblers, you know, a lot of birds have yellow throats. So um, you want to compare and contrast uh, other species. Now the, the age old continuing, um, this is, probably the most common word and probably most common um, uh, thing that people argue about the most is, you know, whether or not continuing is a valid form of documentation. And my opinion is that it's not, um, but that it is certainly encouraged as part of the description. If you say, you know, this continuing, you know, uh, male, uh, you know, first winner, you know, whatever, you're, you're, telling the, the other observers, but, but also the reviewer that, you know, you know that this bird was previously reported. Um, and in a busy place like Los Angeles, you know, knowing that that bird is already there, you can go and look and, and, and you know, help confirm it um, through the database as well. But just simply saying continuing has come back to bite me as a reviewer a number of times with, you know, Virginia's warblers, and then people see Nashville warbler, and then they just say continuing, and that happens for a couple of days, and, and people continue to go, and some people miss it, and some people see it, and so um, continuing in and of itself is, is not enough, but it certainly helps uh, to, you know, uh, buoy uh, the description uh, down the line. Um, it also helps if you can age and sex the bird, um, recognizing that it is a rarity um, is important. Um, people come to California visiting perhaps and report, you know, 20 glossy ibis, you know, and, uh, you know, dark green ibis or something like that is the description. And, and obviously they don't recognize the rarity of, of glossy ibis in California. And so if, if you were to find a glossy ibis, you of course want to say, you know, this is a glossy ibis for these reasons. And this is the, maybe the first one I've seen, or this is, you know, I, I know this is a rare bird. I think, it, I think back east, it's common for people to introduce their documentation with, you know, asterisks or, you know, the, the description starts with rarity or I know this is a high count. It just, it tells the reviewer and other observers like, okay, this person knows, or at least appears to know what they're talking about. Um, how long was it in view? You know, did you see it for a split second or did you study it for 10 minutes and you saw it from all these different angles? These are, these are helpful things to include. And um, while it doesn't have anything to do with identifying the bird itself or documenting you know, its existence, um, explaining where the bird was within like a hotspot, for example, helps other people locate that bird and also you know, track that bird's movements maybe around the park. So you know, just it's in the Northwest corner or in the fig tree, or it's on the South fence you know, near the you know, golf course or the, you know, the, the putting green or something like that, just a little bit of information. Because if you go to a big place like, you know, Paiute Ponds, for example, and you describe eloquently this sharp-tailed sandpiper, but don't say it was, you know, in the, the northeast corner of, of, you know, Teal Pond or something like that, people are going to have a hard time relocating it. So a quick practice. So it's early June, uh, you're sitting in your backyard, and this bird pops up on your feeder and it disappears. Well, what were the what are some you know diagnostic features we can recall from our, our brief uh, interaction with that bird? Well, it was dark above and pale below. It had a big red patch on the chest, and it appeared bigger than the house finches that were also at the feeder. And you're looking and looking, and the, the bird doesn't seem to be coming back, although it's you know reflection is is showing here in the the feeder itself. Um, 
you might want to jot that down or maybe you're keeping a checklist or maybe you want to fire up your phone and, and start, start a checklist and uh, jot down what, what you saw. And then it comes back and um, now we can see, well, it's that dark is a, is a modeling of, of black and brown. You know, it definitely has this, I'm going to reiterate that it has this red patch on the chest and it's certainly bigger than the house finches. It's got these streaks on the flanks, it's got these big white wing bars and the, the large bill is, is, is pink. You know, so you're adding all this information. You, maybe you never get a photo. Maybe at this point you would, okay, I've, I've got an idea of what this is. Now I'm gonna go get the camera. But the important thing is, you know, stream of consciousness, like in the moment, write this stuff down. And then now that you've got everything kind of set in stone in terms of your, you know, uh, flexible memory, um, you look it up and you learn, oh, yeah, this is a, it's a second year male rose-breasted grosbeak that's, you know, hasn't completed uh, you know, it's, it's full molt into that bold black that we associate with, with males. Um, and it's definitely eating seeds. And so then, you know, your description could be something as simple as, you know, this is the first time I've seen this at my feeder. Uh, it was bigger than these house finches. It was, uh, had this black and white pattern with white wing bars. And it had this the red on it. It was just on the chest. It wasn't kind of washed through. Because when people say streaky brown bird with, with big bill and, and red, you know, it's usually a house finch, but if you can talk about where that red is limited to and, um, you know, some of these other characteristics, you know, that helps. And so that's not like a 300 page, well, not 300 pages, uh, 300 word essay or anything like that. Just very simple, you know, it, it probably takes you longer to, you know, get the app up and running and, and choose the correct location that it would be to kind of jot all that stuff down on your phone or on a piece of paper for later. Um, another thing we run into is uh, people uh, having trouble documenting or um, just describing um, high counts. So if you see a large number of birds, um, and this doesn't even have to be a high count. If, if you just see a, a, a large number of birds, you don't have to trip a filter. It's just like, wow, that's a lot of birds. One thing people have a, a hard time doing is estimating um, flock size. And I think uh, more often than not, people are underestimating by you know, sometimes an order of magnitude, how many birds are in a flock. And so a couple ideas here for estimating flock size. Uh, it depends on kind of the bird's behavior. If you're sea watching and you've got this just constant stream of black vintage shearwaters or, or loons or scoters or something like that, you know, you're out there to find something rare. Uh, and so you don't wanna just focus solely on counting loons for the whole hour and a half here at Point Doom. Um, and so what you might want to do is take the average of several one minute counts. So just, okay, from 7 a.m. to 7.01 a.m., I'm going to just count Pacific loons and then jot that number down. I had 115 in a minute and go back to your normal sea watch and just kind of, you know, keep an eye on the loon pulse. And if it kind of seems the same or not, take another, you know, at 7.30, count loons for a minute. And then at the end of the day, you can go back and say, okay, I had 60 in a minute, then I had 15 in a minute, and then I had 45 in a minute. And I was there for 60 minutes. So, you know, three times 20 is 60. And that, that, that's your estimate of, uh, of those counts. Um, well, you, you, you know, sum up the number of birds and then multiply it by the, the, the length of time you were there. If it's a stationary flock, um, you can count just a section of it. Um, you know, like I'm going to count all the birds in the back and then like uh, get the 50 and then be like, okay, there's this many is 50 and then just kind of, you know, rubber stamp through the flock just to kind of come up with an estimate. Um, if you're quick, uh, a quick draw and you can and get a picture of the flock going by, uh, you can uh, look at the photo later on your computer and I'll show you how to do that in a moment and, uh, and just you know, basically manually count the birds or just count the edges and, and, and get an area. But the big thing we don't want you to do two things. One is if you trip a high count filter, so if you put in 600 and it says, oh, exclamation point, this is a, this is a lot of birds for this area, please provide, you know, documentation. We don't want you to just say, eh, I don't want to deal with this. I'm just going to put 599. Okay, the exclamation point went away. I'm, I'm going to stick with 599 or 500. You know, don't reduce your count to avoid, you know, having to say why you had that high number. And then the other thing, this is something that came up last minute. 
Um, some people, uh, there's sort of this like urban legend, I guess, around birding that X just means common or too many to count. And it, it's not that X is wrong, um, but I don't want you to think that X just means a lot. Like X could be one, it could be 10, it could be 100, it could be 10,000. X just simply means present. And so if you're putting X because it's a lot and you don't want to count them, that's okay. But I don't want you to think that that's what you're supposed to be doing. Like, oh, the, you know, the starlings, the starlings are everywhere. I'm just going to put X because you're, you're selling your checklist a little short um, by purposely not providing a count of, of common birds. So when I say bust out the Sharpie, what do I mean? Well, the first thing you can do is just count the side. You know, I'm not going to do this, but it's something like I, I did this before. It's something like, you know, maybe 25 down and then you count 30 across. And so you've got the area of, of sanderlings in this flock. And so, okay, maybe that's 700. That's a, that would be a quick way to do a flock in real life. Or you can just count a quadrant, like I said, and you know, oh, this is maybe 150 times four, you know, maybe it's 600. Or you can really go at it and draw this, all these little shapes on your screen and then go through and count them one at a time and just jot down the numbers. And what, what do you come up with? Well, if you do it one by one, you get 664. If you count a quarter of it and multiply, I guess when I'd done that previously, I came up with 800. And if you just do the sort of the surface area of sanderlings, it's you know 25 by 30 is, is 750. So the real number is 664. 800 is a little over, 750 is a little over. But realistically, those are better than guessing 500 or guessing 1,000. I mean, so any estimate, arguably, is, is better than just a straight guess or certainly X. And so, um, you know, I would, if I was out at Camp Surf and I, I saw these sanderlings, I might say, you know, oh, I don't know, it looks like 500 or 700. And then don't submit the checklist, get home and look at that photo and be like, okay, yeah, I had 664. And so then that's my documentation. I'll just say it was a one by one count from a photo, upload the photo, there you go. One thing I see or we see a lot is simply conservative estimate. So they trip the filter, uh, you know, they have 600, they report 664, or if it was an estimate, probably 700 or 600. And it just says conservative estimate. And I, I don't even really know what that means. I mean, that doesn't tell me that you counted to 50 and, and then estimated from there. It just sounds like a, just a guess. And like I said, any estimate is better than, than just the sort of a, a, gut, a gut instinct, gut guess, because typically you're, you're way off if you guess. So we got our location accurate. Um, at the end of our outing, uh, we have documented our rarities either with photos or, or just some bulleted notes in the field that we're gonna expand upon when we, when we get back. And you know, we're honest, if we missed field marks, it's fine. If we had a lot of birds, um, we're going to explain how we got to those, those high numbers. Um, and so are you done birding? And if you are, you want to stop your track. If you're using the tracks, I would encourage people to use the tracks on the app. Uh, it gives you an accurate distance of where you were. It gives you an accurate, you know, uh, uh, representation of where you were. I don't know how many times I've gone back, especially on island, um, like, oh, where was I? Or how, what route did I take to get down? And then you can just pull up that track and say, oh yeah, I, I crossed here. And it's just, I don't know, kind of helpful to have like, you know, a little personal GPS or later look at a park and realize, oh, wow, I, I totally skipped that park. And, you know, it helps to put these things in the checklist comments as well, a description of, of where you were. Um, but in terms of just the raw effort, uh, distance, time, um, having your tracks on um, is helpful. Now, if you're done birding, definitely want to stop your track, uh, stop the checklist, if you don't, even if you don't have your track on. And um, if you're, even if you're doing it pen and paper, you want to just, you know, draw a line, like I'm done with this location. When you change locations or if you're, if you're changing habitat types, if you come out of the forest into a clearing, you know, you're going to be running into different birds. And so starting a new checklist for that location uh, is ideal. And I think I said this at the very beginning, but the most valuable thing is, is multiple repeated measures, uh, short distance, short time of the same place kind of over and over again. 
Um, so if you're birding from your porch, keeping one checklist for four hours in the morning or in the afternoon is not as valuable as keeping you know, 10 five minute checklists throughout that same period of time because you're losing um, or you're, you're gaining some sort of temporal um, like specificity in that. Like if, if the morning dove only comes into your bird bath between six and 6.30, you know, you're going to be able to piece that out with, with having a couple checklists in the morning and a couple in the afternoon, a couple around lunch, as opposed to like this one long checklist that runs all day, you would never be able to tell, like, you know, you, you have no idea, like the, the dove could come in the middle of the day, it could come in the afternoon. Um, and also multiple uh, measures, uh, you know, drive bar charts better. So the common birds are going to show up more often, the rare birds are going to kind of filter out and be these these thin lines. Um, and then, so stopping the track, uh, and it is editable. So if you're one of those people like me that occasionally gets in the car and drives home and realizes, oh wow, 19 miles, I must have left the track running. Um, there's a very simple way to edit that in, in the field before you submit it. Once you submit it, I don't think you can change it. So if you're done and you've hit stop, uh, if you click this little you know, track map thing next to your distance, um, it'll bring up this second screen and it'll show you an outline of, of where you went. So I got dropped off here. I walked this loop and then I got picked up here and then drove away and then I realized, oops, I left the track running. If you click the little edit pencil tool down the bottom, it'll bring up this third screen or this pops up the bottom of the screen uh, and you get this little dragger and you can slide it back, back to where you got picked up or stopped or you, know, you did a loop back to the car and then hit done and you'll notice it corrects the distance. So we went from 1.5 miles to 1.1 miles, which was you know, the accurate distance I actually walked. Um, then the fourth thing is complete checklists. So a complete checklist is defined as you have reported all of the birds that you were able to identify. Um, if there are birds that you can't identify, it's fine to leave those off. But what a complete checklist is not is just the highlights, just the rarity. You know, you went to um, uh, Malibu Lagoon and you saw a redneck stint, and you were there for thirty minutes. You know, you know, a one species ch complete checklist is is very infrequent. And in that case, you know, that was the only bird you were interested in, but you overlooked the snowy plovers and the marbled godwits and the western gulls and things like that. And so, a complete checklist is all the birds you were able to identify. It's not just a list of of, of the highlights. And as I said before, um, any number, any estimate that you can come up with is going to be better than an X. You can put Xs and use them as a complete checklist, but you'll notice they encourage us to provide estimates uh, in these eBirder of the month contests where you have to submit um, for your checklist to qualify, it has to be uh, no Xs involved. Um, birding on a complete checklist should be your primary purpose. So typically, if you're driving down the highway, that hopefully is not your primary purpose, even if you're you know, the passenger. Um, and um, you're going to be missing so many birds, all the, the small things on the side of the road, that especially with driving, uh, complete checklists uh, typically are, are discouraged. And com while complete checklists are best, and that's what drives all the data analyses and uh, the bar charts and targets and things like that, like targets are rated based on you know, the percentage of, of complete checklists that those birds occur on. It is totally okay to do incomplete checklists. And you saw a red-tailed hawk or a Swainson, you know, you saw a Swainson's hawk while you were you know, on the 405 and uh, you just, incidental incomplete checklist, that's totally fine. But if you're out birding or if you're in your yard or, or you happen to just notice some, some unusual bird, um, if you have five minutes, it is a much more valuable uh, data point if you just say, okay, I'm gonna make this a complete checklist. I'm gonna see what else is around in just five minutes. Five minutes is kind of the, the encouraged minimum cutoff. So, oh, there's a, you know, my first hooded oriole is back in my yard. Rather than just, you know, reporting that to eBird as an incidental, should go out in the backyard and spend five minutes and see what else is around um, in addition to that hooded oriole. So those are the four things um, that almost every checklist should entail. And then the sort of optional thing at the end is if you were part of a group. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, um, 
sharing checklists and why shared checklists are important, especially if you're on organized trips. If you're in a group showing, you know, if you're a field trip leader with a bunch of beginning birders, you know, you, you certainly want to share checklists with them rather than have them all create independent checklists. But, you know, if you're birding by yourself, it's, it's, it would be weird to share that checklist with somebody else if you're alone. So if you're in a group, um, you're hopefully uh, participating and you're contributing to this checklist. Classic example being if you're out on a pelagic. Anybody with eyes or even ears, if something comes calling, screaming over, can, can point things out. They don't, know, they don't need to know how to identify it. They just need to be able to say, you know, hey, what's this bird behind the boat? Oh, it's the short-tailed albatross, you know? And because of that, because everybody's participating, a group checklist uh, is a, there's, there's often a sort of a master, like a parent checklist that is shared amongst everybody and they're editable. You can um, uh, add and subtract things, but ideally everybody's using a one pooled checklist to start from and then you can, you can break it down after that. And the problem we run into is um, if you know, these rogue eBirders, um, if they create their own checklist in addition to or in place of uh, the group checklist, um, it, it's going to inflate the true occurrence of species. And let me give an example of what I mean by that. So we go out on a boat, and let's just say there's six people. And Bruce keeps the checklist, and he shares it with everybody. Everybody has this, this shared parent copy. And eBird, because it's, they're shared and everybody's listed as an observer, uh, eBird just treats this as, as one sample. It's one list. And because it's shared, you can add species, you can remove species, you can adjust counts, you can adjust the time and distance. Oh, I left early. I was only there for you know, a half hour and, and only walked one mile of that field trip. Um, but if you can change these things and it still reads it as, as one list. So you know, Dan might add in that he saw a Palmer and Jaeger that everybody missed and, and Mel may have missed the rhinoceros auklet. So he, he deducts it from his list. As opposed to the other, uh, one alternative is that everybody keeps their own list, and then eBird is going to read this as, as six samples, six inputs in their analyses. And so why does this matter? Well, if, if a June trip goes out of San Diego, for example, or LA, uh, and they keep one, you know, a parent list for that, you know, hour or whatever, uh, and they see red-billed tropic bird, well, uh, the success so far of, of pelagic trips that season is 100%. And if the July trip goes out and they keep one list again and they miss the tropic bird, then the success rate is now 50%. That should be you know, fairly logical. Now, if the August trip goes out and there's, there's no parent checklist or everybody decides to keep their own list and they keep 50 individual lists and everybody misses the tropic bird, well, now the success rate is going to be 1.9%. So, wow, only 2% of, of pelagic trips got uh, you know, tropic bird? Well, of course that's wrong. What really should have happened is you'd have one list for that third trip and then you get 33%. So with the shared list, you're gonna have a, a better reflection of, of reality. And uh, I'll come back to this when, when we look at uh, bird targets later on, but by sharing checklists, you kind of keep the, the true um, uh, you know, rate of occurrence of, of birds closer to reality. Obviously things are inflated for other reasons, but. So if you're out on a field trip, if you're uh, going on a pelagic trip, um, I would encourage you to you know, decide who's gonna keep the list and then we'll share it and then you can edit it when you get home. Or, or if it's or, you know, just like an organized rarity trip, like, oh, somebody has a broad-billed hummingbird in their backyard, you know, 10 of us are gonna go there tomorrow and see it all at the same time. Should probably just share one checklist instead of, of 10 people all keeping a separate version of that. So if you, you know, if you employ your best practices and you do these five things, hopefully you don't get an email from a reviewer if everything is, is done correctly. And, and behind the scenes, we can just accept that report, confirm it and move on and, and everybody will be happy. Um, now, Moving on from that, I want to talk a little bit about um, media uploads and how you can increase uh, the value of photos and audio and, or video. Um, the big thing is if you're uploading photos, you want to crop them to showcase the bird or at least make sure the field marks are visible. Um, it shouldn't be 
you know, a speck at the top of the tree. It's great that people have smartphones and are able to capture things either just just with a just with the camera or you know digi binning or digi scoping, but they neglect to just simply crop that photo very easily within the Photos app on your phone before uploading. Or if they're uploading audio, you know you should cut out the handling noise at the beginning or you know cut it off at the end before all the you know airplanes are flying over or whatever. Multiple angles helps so. If you have multiple photos of a bird, if they're all the same angle, that's less important to upload. But if you've got the front and the back and the side, and maybe you got it in flight or from below, multiple angles helps. Um, I would encourage you to use the rating system uh, with one being low quality and five being high quality. Um, this helps for a number of reasons, but it, it sort of uh, sifts things out. So if you've got really good photos, they go to the top. And then um, if you're using Illustrated checklist, those are going to show up on the illustrated checklist if you're trying to study, you know, molt in hummingbirds like Peter Pyle recently did. Having high quality photos um, easier to find because they're rated correctly helps. Um, add tags. So there's a number of tags I'll show you in a minute. Um, is the bird flying? Is it carrying food? Is it singing? Uh, is it uh, copulating? Something like that. All of these things are helpful uh, that then you can search these tags later on. And then I'm not going to get into audio guidelines, but if you're uploading audio, which I, I would encourage you to do, uh, sort of a growing trend in, in uh, birding is, is bird song uh, recording, there's a whole suite of uh, audio guidelines and best practices for that, including you know, normalizing the, the sound to, to three decibels. Um, so if you have your checklist open, um, You'll either see add media or manage media, depending on whether or not you already have a photo or, or audio in there. And if the screen is, is minimized a little bit, or especially I think if you're on a mobile, like if you're on a phone, you'll get this blue box, uh, which is checklist tools if you're on a, a computer. And I think on a, on a phone, it might show up as just this blue box. And the drop down in there, there's your, your manage media or your, uh, uh, or add media if you haven't done it. And that'll take you to your little, your photo salon and um you know there's all the photos you know that i've uploaded of this varied thrush and, and an american pipit and if you click on a single photo it'll bring it up and here's your rating so one through five i'm not going to get into you know exactly what those mean i would encourage you to read about it but one is low quality five is five is high quality i've given this a three um, you can add notes to it, like you know, maybe a brief description of what it was or the circumstances. Um, some of this may already be in the checklist comment, but if you know you've got something like uh, you know, a bird was injured or or had a, a parasite or um, you know had a tag or a band that you can read, like that stuff's helpful to put in there. You've got this age sex uh, grid, and you know certainly don't do this uh, without knowing, you know, without being sure what you are. Or, or what, uh, hopefully you know what you are, but what the bird is. Um, and, you know, feel free to liberally use, you know, unknown sexes and, and ages. And I felt pretty confident this was an adult male buried thrush based on this, you know, solid slaty back and the dark black bib and the, the wings all look nice. Um, if I'm wrong, let me know in the chat and I'll fix that. Um, there's all these tags. Uh, so is it foraging? Was it vocalizing? Is it carrying food, nest building, you know, et cetera. Um, and you know why is this important? Well, if you wanted to look at, you know, adult sharp shin hawks in flight, you can go into the you know photo database through the explore tools and, and limit it to this. I mean, you could look at just males. You could look at, you know, um, if you're interested in you know um, crossbill call types. You know, you, you're not interested in song or you know um, pictures. You just want the audio. You know, I just want I just want to see calls or flight calls, you know, so by tagging those things, they're then searchable, not only by you, but, but everybody else. Um, and now with no real good segue, I'm gonna briefly talk about the review process. Um, so this is what the review queue looks like uh, behind the scenes, kind of right now, this is when I took a screenshot of it a couple days ago. Um, it's, it more or less looks like the rare bird alert that you might see, but it goes back to the beginning of time uh, for, for records awaiting review. And what we see is, you know, there's a link I can go to the, the whole checklist. Um, I could mouse over this and it'll give me a preview of, of the description or this tells me there's, there's audio, this tells me that there's photo. 
But this little envelope uh, is what generates um, the little boilerplate um, uh, email you may get. You know, thank you for using eBird. You know, I'm a I'm a volunteer like you are, etc. The location, um, you know, and of course we're in LA County, and um, and I can also pull up and compare the filter to see like you know is uh, you know 16 greater scop is that an unexpected count at Long Beach Inner Harbor? Um, you know, I could look and and see you know what what is sort of normal for there by by viewing the filter, which I'll show you in a minute. And here's an example of. Um, you know, one of those personal locations. I don't know where Stagecoach Road is, but it says Avalon. So I assume that means it's on Catalina. And so that's why these, these red nape uh, sap suckers are, are being flagged. But if this hadn't said Avalon, you know, I would, I would have really no idea where that was. Um, so I've said filter and you may have heard that a number of times. And so what do filters, what is the filter and what does it look like? Um, we've gone through and set up, uh, in time um, throughout the year, these little thresholds of, of counts uh, for each species and subspecies uh, within the county. And so you can see that um, up until April 1st, 500 dark-eyed juncos uh, would go through the filter without issue and, and go straight into the database. Um, whereas any time of year, a zero, uh, pink-sided and gray-headed junco are, are set to zero. So if you report one or five or 10, that's gonna, you're gonna get a flag. It's gonna show up, it's gonna ask you for some of that documentation we talked about earlier, and it's gonna go into the review queue. Some things are always rare because they're rare, you know, spatially, like gray-headed juncos and pink-sided juncos are sort of anywhere and always, you know, unusual, or we want documentation on them in, in Los Angeles. Um, but white-crowned sparrows in the winter, you know, a flock of 500, that's probably a lot, but you know, 100, 200, depending on where you are is reasonable in the winter, but in summer, you're not expecting to see any. And so that's something where, you know, May 16th, any single white crown sparrow is gonna trip a filter and it's gonna ask you to provide more information. And people, I think, fail to recognize sometimes that birds can be temporary, tem temporally uh, rare. And so, a comment like not rare, or, you know, I see this in my yard all the time. It's like, well, you probably aren't seeing it in your yard all the time in the middle of July. Um, John Garrett wanted me to mention that um, the uh, documentation and, and sort of the filters, um, some things require more documentation than others. So just, you know, one day late or one day early for a filter is, you know, we're not expecting you to, you know, uh, write. Uh, uh, a manifesto on the, the white crown sparrow in your yard on, on September 9th. But if you had, you know, a Harris's sparrow, that's a different sort of situation. Or if you had a wren tit, you know, offshore or on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, um, things have sort of different, different levels of rarity. So there's no way to really code for that in, in the filters or in the, the review process. But um, just realize that, you know, uh, red third pipit the first week of October may be somewhat expected, but we're still going to want documentation for it. But a um, you know first state record of of something else, a, a tree pipit or something like that in, in Los Angeles would would there's a the bar is 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 much higher. So if we've got all our data in place um, and we've done a good job with our our best practices and everything, hopefully. Um, we have created this rich data set that everybody can use coming to visit Los Angeles or that they will parrot our behavior here in LA and uh, take it, you know, preach the gospel to the masses in, you know, wherever Iowa or New Hampshire or, or Costa Rica. And that when you get there, you'll have all these great resources uh, on eBird uh, to use to, to plan your trip. And so I just wanted to briefly look at a couple of those um, little tools. And um, one is targets. So I think a lot of people are familiar with uh, the rare bird alert and maybe the needs alert, um, which depends on you know something being reported in the last seven days. Um, but you can you can also a, a really fun thing to play with is the target species, and so. I don't know, say, say I'm going to, to well, let's take something, take Florida. I'm going to Florida in March. 
and I want to know uh, what birds can I see in Florida that would be new for my world life list. And for me, because I lived in Florida for some time, my number one target would be Nanday parakeet, followed by gray headed swamp hen and red cockaded woodpecker. Um, and you can print these things and you can sort it by taxon taxonomic order, or you can sort it by, uh, the default is by frequency. So the most likely new bird I would get in uh, Florida would be Nanday parakeet. And this bird is on 2.45% of all complete checklists. And so, you know, basically, uh, for every 100 checklists submitted in Florida, there have been two, um, two contain Nande parakeet. And if you scroll down, it goes, it goes down into, into the weeds and you get into these 0% things. So these aren't complete checklists, these are incidental. So this is maybe like a, a specimen or you know, something from some old notebook. But when you get into these kind of like, into the weeds, so to speak, with these low level things, sometimes the numbers don't really make sense. Um, like, oh, wow, that, you know, Wilson's, Wilson's plover is, is much higher than, um, you know, uh, Harris's sparrow or something in, in, uh, in Los Angeles. And that may just be because, you know, 100 people all went and independently reported um, that uh, redneck stint. And so those complete checklists build up. And uh, that's what I was saying earlier when, when things are, are inflated. So I probably muddled what I, what I intended to say there, but um, by sharing checklists and uh, using group checklists, you, you keep the numbers at, at more of a, uh, a basis that, that reflects reality. So that's targets. Um, you know, you can look at uh, exploring hotspots. I'd mentioned that for, um, uh, by specifically calling out um, uh, Paiute ponds, but like, well, you know, let's say we're going to Miami, Florida, and uh, I'm going to be, um, oops, I'm going to be on whatever this is, this is Key Biscayne or something like that. And oh, well, the, the best place to be would be Crandon Park. So, you know, you, you can then, then pull it up and, uh, you know, go through all your illustrated checklists again, which your bar charts are going to be based on complete checklists, your photos, you know, the top photos are going to be based on you know, the highest rated photos. So you want to make sure you're rating your media correctly. Um, closer to home, maybe. Uh, one thing I would encourage is, um, you know, getting off the beaten path a little bit. I think uh, Richard Crossley was just talking about that with his, his stuff up in the mountains. And a good way to find um, off the beaten path is, is go into the species maps and pull up a common species like house finch, and then just look for big gaps. And if nobody's reported a house finch from here, there's a good chance, oops, there's a good chance nobody's birded there at all. And so I've probably now crashed it by pulling up a very common species, but let's zoom in. And there's this little green space here. And so we zoom in and now there's this park. And, you know, this is the perfect kind of thing to hold, you know, I don't know, maybe these are teepoos and, you know, there's some pines here. So maybe there's a, a yellow-throated warbler there. I mean, who knows? It could be nothing. Um, but just by looking for these gaps on range maps, it's a good way to kind of do some pioneer birding and find things and, you know, suggest this is a hot spot. Like, I don't, what's this little place? Um, this is Green Meadows Recreation Center. So Chris Dean has been there four times. Well, maybe more than once. Let's look. But uh, there are four complete checklists from here, and they're all Chris. So good for Chris for, for thinking outside of the box. Um, and I don't know, don't see anything totally unusual, but all it takes is, is one rare bird and you know, that, that place will be on the map. Um, and then from a, let's go back to my talk here. Um, from a phone perspective, now the app allows you to do basically the same thing. And you can hit explore, uh, pull up it, pull up the app, don't start a checklist, click explore and toggle to this hotspot section. And this was me when I'm on San Clemente Island. So you can see the blue dot was, was where I was at the time. But you can also pull up this tab and say, well, I, I want to do some exploration before I'm at the convention center or whatever and pull up Los Angeles. 
And it gives you the same idea. You can adjust this one miles, 30 miles. Uh, and these are hot spots. Red has been visited in the last seven days. You can change it to 14 or 30. And blue is, is not. And so you, I can just, okay, I'm in my office. Yeah, Bird Wilson Cove. You know, I haven't been down to Mail Point lately, or I haven't been to the dunes. And so it's, it's a way to um, check out your five mile radius or just um, a, a thing I like to encourage people to do is if you're gonna drive 20 miles across town to, to chase something that just showed up, while you're there on your way home, just pull up this explore tab and be like, oh, there's another park down the street. Nobody's been there this week. It's October, anything goes, something, something could be there. So um, I would encourage you to you know, get, off the, get off the beaten path a little bit. Um, and then to wrap it up, uh, basically what we talked about and what I uh, hope people do is have the correct location plotted when they're birding and contribute to hotspots when it's appropriate. Uh, make sure to use short distance, um, uh, you know, high frequency checklists rather than, you know, just one checklist uh, for the, your whole outing for the day. You know, we shouldn't be seeing 50 miles in urban terrain. Um, make sure you have good documentation, whether it's just notes you took, uh, photos you took. Um, uh, avoid that X whenever possible. X means present. Um, it doesn't mean common. Um, so uh, anything, any, any way to use those uh, high count, um, high flock count estimate tools is, is great. Share checklists whenever possible, um, especially, you know, there's this beginning birders 101, you know, uh, explain to them, you know, the sort of philosophy behind shared checklists and, and why it's important. And when you're, when you're uploading your photos, or even if you already have photos uploaded, uh, go back and you know, spend some time rating them. I and mean, this is a thing I, I think a lot of people were doing during stay at home was going back and either uploading old photos or going back and tagging them. Like I'm gonna tag every photo I have of, of master or, or song. And you'd be surprised how these photos get used in publications or just, you know, you might get a, a solicitation. Hey, you've got this great photo of a singing bird I found because I'm doing a newspaper article about singing and I found yours because it was tagged correctly. And that's pretty much it. And I'm sure I went way beyond the time I was supposed to speak, but uh, if you have any questions, throw them in the Q&A, I guess. And here's my email address. Feel free to uh, talk to me offline later. And that's it. Justin, that was wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Um, I guess we have lots and lots of questions lots and lots of questions before we get into the questions i do want to point out to people that many we have several ebird reviewers on uh, on the line along with justin and including kimball john veenstra and john garrett and they have already answered a number of questions and they are written if you click on your q a down at the bottom You'll have questions, and then next to it, you'll have a tab for answered questions. You'll be able to see the questions and answers. We will also, Mark, please confirm, we will also be putting those questions, written questions and answers up so that uh, they will be on our webinars tab on our website. Oh, um <laughs> I, I can, I'm pretty I don't sure know I can, how to do that. I'm pretty um, sure I can capture that information. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, what if, I was if, thinking of doing was was just going through some of them for the uh, uh, people who. Um, well, depending if, on how many other questions we have. If it yeah. if it works, you can thank me. If it doesn't work, blame Mark. Or oh, no, actually, it's blame Mark. And, no, 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 I'm not there. I'm 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 that over there. Okay, go ahead. I think we're all set. <laughs> Okay, um, so some of the open questions. Um, so Carol is uh, asking, um, how do you sign up for alerts? Um, John, do you want to do you have a canned answer for that? Uh, it's in Explore, I think, right? Um, yeah, if you go into Explore, the Explore tab and scroll down into the sort of the third bar, there's a thing called alerts. And uh, it's got like a juvenile mask booby, I think, next to it. You click that and you can view alerts. You can subscribe to alerts for state, county. Uh, you can have them come hourly. You can have them come daily. Um, and uh, you'll get a barrage of them if you do them 
hourly and yearly. <laughs> <laughs> yep, great. No, no. Great, cool, got it. <laughs> <laughs> great, thank you. Um, John and Erica asked, are filters established manually or auto set by data? And if manually, who does it? Either way, it might be useful if the filters were public. I'll give that one to John. Um, yeah, so um, they are set by us, you know, flawed humans who are imperfect beings. Um, but we do often base them on data that exists in Ebert, as well as just our overall knowledge and understanding of you know when and where birds occur and you know a purely data-driven filter um would also have challenges like um you know some some things are identification challenges so we keep numbers extra low um based on those um they filters are in kind of an interesting place where they're not fully public, but the URLs are available, like anyone can look at them. So if you're really curious and you want to see what they are, you can send me a message and I can send you a link to them. Um, there are, sure, send, send me a link, John. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you, you can look at them, that, that's fine. Um, but yeah, it, you can't find them just by digging around on mm -hmm. the public keyword face. Great, thank you. Um, Randy asks, should copyrights on photos be discouraged? Um, I, I believe so, but I'll let the official answer. Yeah, uh, you, you know, we, we can't stop you from, from using them if you really want to, but um, Photos are much, much more useful for a much broader set of applications if they don't have copyrights or like the, I assume you mean like the little watermark symbols that, that some people stick on on their photos. Um, like if you want your photos to ever appear in Merlin or to be in any of the other places that, you know, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology or anyone else who uses our photos um, to be able to use them in like all these various functions, um, not having a watermark goes a long way. Um, can certainly read the full terms of use and, and everything on there that, that goes with them. I see Kimball has his hand up. And we always attribute them. Yeah. It's a, Mar Marshall Eilif is, is here with me. We're, we were in the middle of a, a chess match. But, um, <laughs> he, he, uh, hey, he knows him. He, uh, he's one of the founders of Ebert. So I've been for, uh, yeah, just so writing him right. notes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but good to see so I, I raised my hand because I wanted to just briefly mention one of my biggest pet peeves about eBird and its use. When you enter your basic coverage data right at the beginning of your checklist, the date, the location, and time, and all that, there's a box there for comments. And checklist comments, I think, can be one of the most useful things in an eBird list. And it's my experience that probably 5% of eBird users at best actually use them. And that's a real shame. Um, way back when naturalists used to have notebooks and write all this stuff down and there was tremendous information. Nowadays, it's just plug in the numbers and submit your checklist. But think of all the information you can put in there. Um, who were you birding with? What were the weather conditions, which can have a huge impact on what you see? What habitats did you cover? What were some interesting things you noticed? Um, there's a zillion things you can write about, and it, to me, it's just a huge shame that people tend not to use that at all. Now, I know some people use the checklist comments, but then hide them because you can't hide them to public output. Um, I encourage you to use them and not hide them. I would also encourage eBird, hi Marshall, down the line to perhaps give users the option of having hidden checklist comments and public checklist comments so that you could um, maybe put all your grousing and complaining in one hidden list, hidden set of comments and the, the useful stuff like weather conditions in the public uh, comments. But anyway, just I really implore and encourage people to use the checklist comments and be very specific about your coverage, the conditions, the weather and all that. Um, I know that eBird wants to keep things simple so as not to discourage people from using it. 
but I really think it ought to be required. You ought to be required to give things like a summary of weather conditions and other things. That's not going to happen anytime soon. So please just take the initiative and use those checklist comments and I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now, but thanks. Great, thank you, Kimball. Um, we'll, we'll get right on that. <laughs> Let's see, next question. Um, Kathy asks, could you discuss a little about using the app when out of range, I guess out of cell phone range? Doesn't seem that you can do several checklists when out of range or I just don't know how. Well, as long as you've got the, the pack downloaded for where you're going, you should be able to start a checklist. And while you won't be able to upload that checklist, uh, you can just hide it and then and start a new one. And you can have you know, thousands of checklists unsubmitted on your phone. Um, but having the pack <laughs> downloaded ahead of time is, is important. Uh, Marshall, is that the correct answer? <laughs> <laughs> That's the correct answer. Just Try to submit your checklist before you hit the thousand mark. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll test the uh, the durability of the, the framework. Yeah. Your checklists are only safe when they're submitted to the database. That's true. Like, yeah. Whenever once, you get once they're in, you can always just re-edit them at any point. So. Uh, when I when I've been traveling, yeah, internationally, it's like we should eat dinner. I'm like, not until I upload these checklists. We got to find Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> trying to trying to re reassemble something with a hundred species on it's not possible. Um, yeah, so that was answered. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, Ruth asks, I don't understand the location option that was between hotspot and personal. Um, the I think that's the uh, the stakeout rarity hotspot. Yeah, I may have mentioned stakeout. It's I mean it's it's effectively a hotspot. Uh, it's just is treated a little bit differently. And it's really designed to capture uh, a single species. Um, so, um, so does that mean a location someone else has already used? And is it better to use that than to add another personal location? Is yeah, that... I mean, if you, if you go to, like when that oriental turtle dove showed up in Palo Alto, like the very first thing I did was like make a, a stakeout for that because I knew otherwise there's gonna be a thousand personal locations in that neighborhood. Um, and if you if you if if you're at a location for that bird and there's a stakeout with that name, yeah, that's the, the best thing you can do is use that. One thing we run into sometimes is you know it's a stakeout from several years ago and people go back and then they continue to contribute to that location and I don't know how best to how how best I I defer to. Ebert HQ on, on what to do about that. Fine. Yeah. yeah it's fine. Okay. It's, I mean, it's probably the same little set of teepoos in an office park that Paul was crawling around under or something. So, yeah, stakeouts are basically hot spots. They're just um, basically designed for with a single bird in mind, but you know, you want to input all the, the data from them or at them. All right. Great. Um, no, no extra uh, comments from eBird Central there. Um, no, nope, nope, that was great. <laughs> okay. Um, so Liz asks, how do you handle eBirding an area that is on a county line? eBird HQ. <laughs> um, so we do have a help center article that actually describes this in some detail. Um, called eBirding under like special circumstances or eBird policies for special circumstances or something like that. Um, basically our recommended practice is just record everything you see no matter what or, or everything you detect no matter what. Um, we don't care about county lines um, for you know the, the types of things we're concerned about. If you are really concerned about your county lists and that's what motivates you, um, what you can do is do two checklists, one on either side, and just make them both incomplete checklists and only record what you saw on each side of the county line there. Um, but that's of slightly less scientific value. Um, and it's, I don't know, I, I think it's better to kind of reframe the way you think about it and uh, just record everything you detect. But yeah, if, if county lists are what you really care about, 
um, go ahead and do that. And we have a help center article that describes it. And I just put the link to that help center article in the, the answer to that question. Great, thank you. Um, see, Carol asks about measuring distance. Um, when I walk out uh, one out and back route for a total of five miles, should I add the total miles would be 2.5 when I continue to add birds that I didn't see on the way in? And that, I guess there's two parts to the question. And then what about routes where portions of, of the route involves a circle? The lollipop. The lollipop. I, I was talking with John about this, so I'm going to defer to him. Um, yeah, so what I would say, um, use a track whenever possible um, when you're using eBird Mobile, and that will just record everything. And um, hopefully, eventually, there'll be a way to auto calculate all of these distance measures, and you won't even have to worry about it. Um, if you don't have a track, then yeah, it's unique distance is what you want to record. Um, so any historical data, or if you're using eBird Mobile and turning tracks off for some reason, um, then it is unique distance. And John, just to clarify, that's complete distance out and back. No, that is um, one direction. And then if you cover the same area again, um, don't count that. And that's that's only if you're not using a track. So the lollipop, you'd have the the stem of the lollipop, and then the circle, and then not the stem again. Exactly. Yep. And those are things where, yeah, if you're on trails, like you know, internationally, this comes up a lot. This is where the checklist comments are helpful. Like, uh, you know, you get to a, a fork in a trail, and I might make a note like, you know, first leg was 0.5 miles, and then when you go around the circle, and you, oh, I'm back where I started. Okay, and I know this is. Uh, you know, uh, duplicate distance, I need to, to edit later, but yeah, unique distance, but if you're using a track, just let the track do its job. And yeah, like John said, hopefully someday the, you know, the computers will, will be able to tell us where we were. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, Alex asks, why can't everyone upload videos? Are only selected individuals allowed to do so? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uploading video is a pretty new thing still. Um, and it's, it's definitely, we have big servers, but we're not quite ready to open the floodgates on every cell phone video from every eBirder across the planet. Um, that's not to say that we don't hope to do that at some point, um, but but for now, um, the focus is sort of on people that that really have a digital SLR, a tripod, and are are, are going for that high quality video that um, that we do expect to use increasingly in in Merlin and in you know um, materials you get through Birds of the World or all about birds or other things. Um, so it's it's still restricted, but um, but I do think we can accept expect to see that curtain lift um, with time. And if you and if you are someone who's shooting shooting really high quality video, get in touch with John. He'll <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, thank you, Marshall. Yeah, that's a lot of data um, that you have to worry about. <laughs> Everybody does it. Um, let's see, and Carol asks a good uh, practical question. How do you hide a checklist in the app? Or maybe you can't, I don't know. I do not believe that you can. I know you can in the website. Yeah. Um, so my, my advice would be, be prepared to quickly go onto a browser and, uh, and hide it. Um, if you've got some sensitive thing that you don't want to go out on the alert, don't submit it for at least eight days, um, you know. There's, there's help articles about, uh, you know, privacy concerns and things like that. But uh, yeah, there's no, there's no way to, to hide. Um, it has to be submitted before it can be hidden. And so I don't think there's a way to toggle that in the app. I guess you can, once you've submitted it, you can just go to the checklist link and there's a, a link to ebird.org within the, the checklist at the bottom. And then you can, um, I assume the little blue, here you go. <laughs> yeah. 
No. Take it away, John. No, no, you're describing it perfectly. I was just going to show what you're talking about. Yeah, once you've but... submitted it in the bottom center, there's ebird.org, and that'll take you to the, the, the checklist in, the, in your browser. And then within that, you should have a, a blue uh, checklist tools icon. It's like a little pencil in the top right. And then click that as John's showing and drop down. I think the very last one or near to the bottom, it should say hide from output. Yeah. yeah. What is the phrase? Hide, hide from ebird output? Hide from ebird output. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. And in general, like, you know, there, there are certainly reasons that we, you know, that this feature exists and, and to hide it. Um, if you want your checklist to be valuable for birders and scientists, um, it's best to unhide those at a later date when it's, you know, when you feel it's safer. Yeah. Um, but sensitive that. species, you know, private property concerns. I mean, those are all valid, especially in, in high density areas like Los Angeles. And yep. uh, if you hide something, just remember to unhide it somewhere down the line so that those long-eared owls or that, you know, rare hummingbird in your yard makes it its way into the public database for scientists and conservation. Sounds good, Mark. There's great, no thank question. you. And there's another question uh, from Kathy. Will personal locations ever be able to be used by someone else if that location isn't ever designated a hotspot? Yes, if you share it with them. So if you like to compete mm. with your friends for their yard list, uh, they just have to share a checklist with you. And then that location will appear in your recent locations or your personal location. Yeah. Um, but you can't just go to someone's yard down the street that you don't know and, and contribute to their yard list through their personal location. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Um, if you're, uh, this is a question from Hannah. If you're in a big park and there's just one public hotspot for it, should you use that regardless of where you are in the park rather than creating a new personal hotspot with your more specific location? My advice is to always use the hotspot. And if it reflects, you know, where you were to some degree, and then you can make uh, comments in the checklist or in the species comments for where, you know, a rare bird was. Um, if it's something that's a distinct part of the park, like it has a distinct habitat type, you could create a personal location and then suggest it as a hotspot. And I would look up how to do that in the help center um, because some of these big parks like Golden Gate Park and um, you know some of the national parks, there's these sort of nested, um, there's a sort of a nested framework where there's like sub hotspots. Um, but just a personal location, again, it isn't gonna drive those cool tools you get from hotspots like illustrated checklists and bar charts and, and people are less going to be uh, unable to find, you know, your recent visit um, to help guide their exploration. Okay. Uh, that would be, that's you. my advice. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Kimball has a hand up. So it might, might be for this question. Yeah. No, actually, it's not. But I wanted to hop back on the soapbox for a second. We are, in, with the increasing use of Merlin for sound identification, we are seeing as documentation very frequently now for flags, rarities, identified by Merlin or sound identified by Merlin. That tells us nothing other than that Merlin sometimes is correct and sometimes isn't. So please also upload the recording you made that Merlin based its identification on. Um, that gives us something to actually go on because Merlin is as valuable as it is and it gets better all the time. It isn't right 100% of the time. And in some cases, in some areas, it's not right um, even a comfortable percentage of the time. So please upload the audios that you've based your identification on because we're seeing this increasingly now in checklists. Thank you. I, I will give Merlin credit. It appears to have found the first gray cat bird for Catalina Island a few days ago. <laughs> that's, that's cool. Yeah, I, I just want to add to what Kimball said. Um, totally, totally agree with what he said. The two pieces I would add are that make sure, make sure, sure, sure that you have location enabled on Merlin 
because if you don't, then Merlin doesn't doesn't know where you are. So so when it's wrong, it may be wrong with an East Coast bird or a Mexican yeah. bird or something. That's how um, you get urban uh, American dippers singing and things like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> right. If you have your locations on, then then Merlin's actually using the filters. It's using the frequency locally to um, to make sure it doesn't make wild mistakes. Um, and then and then the other piece is like don't just put what Merlin says. Like Merlin, Merlin's like asking your friend, like John and I go birding and I'm like, hey, John, did you hear that? That sounded like a black throated gray to me. And he says, I don't know, it sounded like a Townsend's to me. Um, <laughs> and then like, you have to use that, you know, exchange and, you know, sort of figure out which one's right. But, but think about Merlin, like you're asking a birding buddy that is pretty good a lot of the times, like can get a cat bird on Catalina, but, um, but isn't right 100% of the time. And yeah. if you blindfold that friend and stick them God knows where in the world and you don't know where they are, that's the equivalent of like not selecting your, you know, enabling your location in Merlin. So that, that, that makes the guesses a lot wilder. But um, if that friend is like, you know, they know the birds of the area that they grew up in and, you know, they know that that's where they are, they'll probably do a lot better. <laughs> Great. Uh, Carol has another question. Um, so our, our group was asked by Dr. Bloom not to report the exact location of some Swainson's hawk. Maybe it was roosting or something like that. Um, I'm guessing. What do you advise regarding the Swainson's hawk? Um, that might be nesting pairs, in which case, I, I don't know. I'm, always, I'm of the opinion that it's, it's not good to report nesting sites for, for raptors and roosting owls, but I don't know what the official comment is. Yeah, no, like that, that to me, that's a clear case. Like anytime that you're worried about well-being of a bird, go ahead and hide the checklist. That's, that's yes. what that yeah. is for. So put it in eBird, but hide the checklist. Yep. Rather, yeah, because or, another, another um, thing that I've heard people do is um, put in a vague location or put in a, you know, or, or a slightly incorrect location. Um, and the question is, would you, would you recommend doing that to protect the bird rather than um, hiding the checklist? I mean, it's all context dependent. Um, and it's, it's certainly okay to have a slightly fudged location for that particular reason, or like, um, you know, it says in the help center, it, if you want to report birds from your home and not let people know exactly your home address, it's okay to have like, you know, a street as, or, you know, something within like the general realm of where you live. And that, that, that's okay. Just so long as it's, you know, within that realm. Um, obviously like precise locations are better whenever possible, but if, if there's a good reason not to, then it's okay to, to um, obscure that. It's, it's often helps to mention that in the name maybe, but um, yeah, that, that, that is also why hiding checklists exists. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's see, any more? I'm not seeing any more. Uh, no, uh, I think the questions are. There are some in the chat. Check the chat. Okay, um, Lance, if you can help us. Uh, sure, I'll ask mine. In. Sure, go ahead. So, so one of the issues is when you're a panelist, you can't type something into the Q and A part. Right. Right. And so that's why I put them in the chat. That's fine. So yeah, my my first question was, what fraction of people who regularly contribute to eBird use the phone app? It's funny. I just asked John that. <laughs> I was going to say sixty-five. But pretty sure it's like 60 to 65 percent i'd have to look into some stuff to to get you a more precise answer but off it's the top 62.5 percent <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. great thank you any more it's, chat it's questions been, continues to go up yeah yeah because the app is, is is very useful much better than yeah, very losing cool. pieces of paper and trying to read your own handwriting Yes, but pieces of paper, the battery doesn't quit. Yeah. <laughs> My cell phone battery doesn't last very long. Oh, you need a new phone. <laughs> so so I've, I've got a broader eBird question. Um, 
if you've ever met birding in the UK, you know that those are some of the most diehard, passionate birders on the planet, and there are a lot of them. And yet eBird use there is pitifully small. What's going on? So shouldn't be pitifully small anymore. Um, we, we sort of turned a corner in the UK when Alex Lees, who just put out a really cool book on vagrancy, um, was, was at the lab for a postdoc for a year. Um, but he really went back and kind of has connections there that, um, so, so the UK has, has a basically competing app called BirdTrack. Um, and for a long time, you know, it's sort of been, you know, BirdTrack has a lot of use in the UK, largely because it's plugged into a lot of the national monitoring there. A lot of the, um, a lot of the county recording network, they were really sort of advanced, like everything that was seen in the county each year. Um, so, so BirdTrack has, has been really plugged into all that. Um, what BirdTrack hasn't done very well is sort of be a global system for people. Um, and that is a place that I think eBird's done pretty well. We're always trying to do better, but, um, but in the, in the UK, we're almost not, not quite at the level of data that, that BirdTrack is putting in now, but, but pretty close. It's sort of like a, you know, six to four ratio or something now. Um, so we do a lot of political <laughs> dances with other groups to try to figure out like, can we find a way to meld these two systems? It's really hard to take two databases with sort of different structures, different taxonomies and, and just plug them together. But um, I'll say that we, uh, we recently haven't been dancing very much, but we're starting to dance a little bit again. So there, there, may, be, there may be hope to really like tie that knot and, um, and see a lot more collaborative bird recording in Europe. So. Yeah, on a related note, the similar thing is is in going in uh, in Italy. Like Ottavio, Johnny, I notice he imports all of his stuff into eBird as well, but it's a different, uh, you know, there's like coordinates and things. So there must be an, an Italian version. Are you making inroads there? Yeah, Ornitho is a, a similar one that um, okay. they they have a lot of country specific ones that. You know, again, they've sort of had this long, you know, decade long run of becoming popular in the country and being, you know, having perfect language support in, yeah. in that country. So um, as eBirds um, doing better and better with translations, you know, we, we can sort of at least offer the two side by side and say, if you're a global birder like Otavio, <laughs> yeah. um, you're going to want to put them in for your Columbia things. Um, who, who works as a translator. <laughs> yeah, who works as a translator. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, there are basically every country in Europe has its own system. Um, there's, yeah, some Portugal, Portugal, Turkey, Spain, we have formal partnerships with um, and different countries we have really strong or sort of, you know, medium strong to low participation. But, um, it's a, again, it's a kind of ongoing dance at sort of the, the Europe wide level. With, with groups that are trying to plug all these disparate systems together to do modeling across Europe. Um, they're pretty, pretty jealous of what we've been able to do in the Americas with, with eBird because we, we've integrated this one system and, and can, can put out those models, but it's a much harder prospect to have like Ornitho from Italy, BirdTrack from the UK, Art Portalen from Sweden, you know, the Denmark system, the Belgium system, which are all different. You got to fix the taxonomy. You got to fix the protocols. Figure out how to model that is a is a huge statistical challenge, above and beyond the huge statistical challenge of, of a billion eBird records. So, um, anyway, it's I, continues to get better everywhere. I think, um, but it's a long it's a long road in some places. Well, thank yeah. you all very, very much. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Justin. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was excellent. We really, uh, your this presentation along with John Garrett's was just absolutely wonderful. Speaking of John, I see it's a very well, um, a very nice looking room you're in. So obviously you're over at Marshall's house. I am, yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's leaving in like three hours to take his four-year-old son to the Dominican Republic and see all of the endemics in the next two weeks. So I'm, I'm going to be dogs. Oh, wow. There. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. That's, that's great. Anyways, hey, Marshall, thank you. Marshall, when you're in the Dominican Republic, record all of the Orioles. 
there there's some real gaps in the Oriole collection down there. Okay, that's a good. <laughs> that's a good I, I've been there, and I, I I hope I see at least one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Justin. That was really an excellent talk. We really appreciate your time and effort for presenting, and I think you raised a lot of questions and uh, answered a lot of questions. And uh, you know, I think that this is this is an evolving story, and maybe in a year or two you can come back and tell us what the next next version of, uh, of your talk looks like yeah thanks for having oh, me great. I mean, it was it was hard to you know to pare it down and even up to the last minute i was like well i'm getting into the weeds like cut that slide and you know we're talking about merlin i mean you could talk just an hour about merlin and you could talk yeah. an hour just about you know going more on going on and on about hot spots and you know david bell's our main hot spot editor here in los angeles and you know all there's there's a number of topics related to eBird that can stand yeah, alone. Absolutely. I also want to thank the entire eBird team for being here just about. Uh, you guys are great. I really appreciate it. And I think everyone that sees the, uh, this webinar will really appreciate it. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, we will see you next month. Um, and anything else to add? I think that's it. I, I think that's it. And, you know, and John, please send me the URLs for the filters because <laughs> we've had several requests and yes. uh, maybe I yes. can stick them on the website. Right. Absolutely. And thank you guys, the East Coast guys for staying up to nearly midnight to help. Well, they have to finish a chess game. So that oh, that's true. Well. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, good night, everyone. Thank good you. Night, all everybody. Very much. Good night, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you guys. For thank coming. you, Justin. Thank you, Justin.